Hello and welcome. In this year of Scotland stories, we're going to hear this evening about an old story that gives a surprisingly rich insight into aspects of life, even continuing into today. Now, before introducing the speaker, I should mention there's an opportunity to ask questions, and that's by a system called Slido. So if you have mobile phone in hand, all you have to do is scan that image, the QR code, and that will link you to the Slido site where you can forward questions to us. Or if you don't have mobile phone in hand, but a computer's near, well, www.slido.com is the link to go for. But now to our speaker, an ideal speaker for this mixture of disciplines that are required to interpret the story we're going to hear. Dr. Neil Banas is an oceanographer and a mathematical ecologist. He's reader at the University of Strathclyde. He's an ecosystem modeler for the Atlantic Salmon Trust and the Missing Salmon Alliance. And interestingly and valuably in the area he's going to describe, he also has a degree in comparative religion. He has a story to tell us and some fascinating implications. Neil, I'm going to sit back and hand over to you. Tell us a story. Well, thanks, Howie. It's a, a real pleasure to be back here at the festival. As Howie said, I, I have two stories that I'd like to uh, talk to you about tonight. Uh, you could think of them as two stories or as two models of the world. I, I think those things are largely interchangeable if the story is a good enough one. The first of these stories was told in 1900 in Haida Gwaii, uh, the islands uh, of the Haida Nation off the west coast of Canada in the North Pacific. And the second one is a mathematical model of plankton dynamics um, that I've worked on over the years, trying to catch up in a way with the, the realism, the ecological realism that I see in that story from Haida Gwaii. So here is Haida Gwaii, uh, at the edge of the North Pacific. And if you zoom in from the point of view of a, a satellite that we use to sense uh, ocean color and therefore the concentration of, of uh, phytoplankton, that's the plant-like plankton in the ocean, you see these huge swirls uh, coming off the, the place where the currents um, separate from land. Uh, this wedge uh, next to the big swirl in the middle of the image, that's Haida Gwaii, uh, which translates to the land of the Haida, uh, although they, they were known previously uh, for some time as the Queen Charlotte I Islands, and known long before that uh, by a phrase in Haida that means the islands on the boundary between worlds. Now, if we dove down into those plankton blooms, the ones indicated by that uh, fairly garish rainbow from high concentrations near the land to low concentrations out in the interior of the ocean, the, the white is, is clouds, we'd see uh, a very complicated community of microorganisms like this. These are the forests of the sea, um, 8,000 species of single-celled photosynthesizing protists and bacteria um, that come with their, uh, like all forests, come with um, a host of animals as well and a really complicated ecology. And chasing after the dynamics of this community is uh, my day job, something I try to do with mathematical models. And the mo motivation, uh, well, there's many motivations uh, since they're the very base of the food web of the oceans. But we see sometimes that very small shifts, what, what seems like it might be a small shift in the ocean has huge consequences. It tilts the community of the phytoplankton in a way uh, with big implications. For example, a bit south of Haida Gwaii, in 2015, there was a, a marine heat wave. Things heated up in the surface ocean by just a degree or two. And that was enough though, to change the, the flux of nutrients from the deep ocean to the surface, enough to change the composition of the phytoplankton enough that a toxic species bloomed in large concentrations all over the west coast, causing fish kills and marine mammal kills and um, threats to human health. 
the same sorts of dynamics are at the base of the many, uh, many step story that leads to organisms like salmon that swim through these complicated fields where the physics and the biology and the chemistry interact, integrating all of those effects over the course of uh, one year over one life cycle. And of course, the uh, salmon in the North Pacific, like the salmon in uh, the North Atlantic, have been declining for decades on top of other forms of variability, and we want to know why. We can't possibly observe these complicated multi-scale stories directly, and so we rely on mathematical models. We try to simulate the ocean, and it's a lovely dream anyway, to have a version of the ocean in your computer that you can perform experiments in, you can ask questions about, that you can use as a crystal ball. But it's really difficult to do. And that's not only because of capturing the wide range of characters, you could say, in these stories, all the way from those many species of phytoplankton up through their grazers and the grazers on their grazers up to salmon or, or humans. The problem is that even if you have the right cast of characters and the right landscape, it's very difficult to get the equations of a simulation model to make them interact in the right way. In, in, interact in a way that feels realistic in the sense of the individual interactions adding up to the right texture of outcomes, the right plot, um, the right predict level of predictability, for example. And that's a problem I've been interested in for a number of years. And this is where this story from Haida Gwaii that I'd like to tell you comes in. So this is Skidigat, one of the larger towns on Haida Gwaii. Uh, this and some of the photos that follow are from when I was there uh, 10 years ago. A hundred years before that, uh, in 1900, uh, an ethnographer, a young ethnographer from Yale who worked with Frank Boas, went to Haida Gwaii thinking he would stay a short time and collect a few stories. Uh, but he sat down, uh, he won an audience, I should say, with uh, the best storyteller in Skidigat at that time, a man named Sky. Uh, and a young translator named Henry Moody. And the three of them sat over the course of, of many months, um, painstakingly uh, translating a, an epic unfolded by sky, uh, traditional stories, a traditional story cycle uh, on the scale of the Odyssey or the Iliad. Swanton was not expecting this. Um, he had some trouble convincing uh, his boss back at Yale to let him stay and continue focusing on this. What he ended up publishing in 1905 was plot summary, um, as was the fashion of the time. But more recently, much more recently, a Canadian poet named Robert Bringhurst has gone back to the original line by line transcription and translation worked out by the three uh, people who were there in, in Skidigat, Sky, Henry Moody, and, and Swanton and restored what to a poet's eye he sees in that original telling of the story, um, epic verse where images rhyme and there's uh, dense structuring and the, the way, the mode of the telling is as much um, the art as, as the plot. So that's what I'm drawing on. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is a story um, very, quickly uh, summarized from Ringhurst's translations of Swanton's transcription of Skye's story. So this is a fourth hand telling and uh, it can't serve all purposes. It serves a very particular purpose for me, I suppose. My interest in it is, um, I guess, at the level of craft uh, regarding these questions of how do you make a, a realistic capsule version of a society or, or an ecosystem. But of course, these stories are also part of a living tradition in Haida Gwaii. Um, they're an oral tradition. They, the stories are passed on with changes, with adaptation over a very long time. And they have a, a quite complicated social and, and legal meaning, uh, as well as the conceptual literary meaning that I can tell you about. If you want to learn more about this, you really can't do better than to go to the Haida Nation's own way of explaining how it brings its traditional principles and values into the very practical work that the Haida Nation is doing, protecting its own resources. They have a very uh, ambitious and active 
and hard-won partnership with the Canadian government to, um, to manage their seas. And the values carried by these stories are, um, in their own words, a big part of that. But you should really let um, the Haida tell you that rather than me. Now, Sky was telling this story in a, a mission town in 1900, but the world of the story was a world that even in 1900 was fading very quickly into the past. This is Skye's village uh, from 1878. Uh, it was empty by 1900 because over the course of Skye's lifetime, 95% of the Haida were killed by smallpox and other epidemics. In other words, this story was told at the end of a genocide. It was told at the end of the world. And Sky was in what must have been essentially a refugee camp, living in the wrong kind of house with this innocent emissary from the, the colonial power that had done this damage coming and asking him, in effect, now that we've taken everything else, can we have your stories too? So there's a, there's a complicated context, but it's a context that I think unfortunately speaks to us as we contemplate where uh, the oceans are headed in some ways. So without further ado, here is a very, very uh, abbreviated telling of the one they hand along. So in a village that was perhaps something like Kuna, uh, there, was a, there was a child of good family, as they say, the daughter of the headman. Everyone wanted to marry her. She didn't want to marry them. She sent them all away. And then one day, this figure appears dimly seen in the story. Uh, off in the distance, sitting in his canoe. And he asks for uh, the girl and she refuses. And then uh, I, I see this as a, a, a cinematic moment as, as who this is becomes gradually clearer. Something encircled his hat, I'm quoting Bringhurst's translation. It was white, they say. It moved like breaking surf, they say. It was foaming and churning, they say. And if you were a traditional audience, you would know already who this was and what was going to happen next. When they refused him, seawater began to surge over the ground. It turns out that this is uh, the son-in-law of an incredibly powerful figure from the bottom of the sea. He leaves the hat on the beach, he takes the daughter with him and disappears and then begins an epic quest to get her back. They slip under the edge of the sky, time dilates. Um, it's a, a grand and, and circuitous adventure. They, they don't make a direct plunge for the place where this figure has gone um, with their beloved daughter. Instead, they, they circle around, they make alliances. Um, they enlist the help of all sorts of powers like Mouse Woman, a little grandmother who you should not underestimate. And eventually they make their way to a village at the bottom of the sea that is surprisingly like their own. And in this village, they make their way into the, the biggest house, an impossibly grand house. And in the back, uh, behind the fire, uh, behind the, the painted screen where you would normally find the private quarters of the head the, the head family of a big multi-family house, they don't find small living quarters. What they find is a bay full of sand, speed, sand spits and beaches and cranberries ripening. They find um, this world of, of coastal plenty because it turns out that this is the house of, of this figure, an impossibly dangerous and imposing and wealthy figure um, who's sometimes called uh, the one in the sea bulging eyes, who contains all the wealth of the deep sea, the place where all the wealth that, that comes churning up onto land comes from. And it was his son who had taken his hat without permission, left it in the human village without permission and in exchange for the daughter. And that turns out to be the crux of the problem, that there has been an improper exchange. The hat wasn't his to give. So there's a feast. Uh, they're eating impossibly rich foods like humpback whale on the end of a stick. Uh, 
And then there's a, a, a moment, an exchange that I, I really love where uh, the, the lady in question here is the mother of the girl, the human um, mother of, of good family. And she comes, she's in the house of, of a God. She's being fed impossibly uh, uh, rich food, except she's given as eating utensils, the old rotten shell of a horse clam. And she's a, a woman of good family. She's not willing to eat in this way. So out of her purse, she takes a fresh pair of clam shells, um, clam shells that make perfectly good utensils, very similar to things that I've seen um, in reconstructed black houses in Scotland, actually. And just then, in this world of spirit beings at the bottom of the sea, silence falls. Because what is there that humans, after all, can give to the god of the deep sea? Well, um, fresh shells that have not been sitting at the bottom of the sea, rotting and collecting algae and barnacles. And this is the turning point, this pair of shells, because now it's possible for the humans and the sea to make a proper exchange. And they go out and they gather themselves and they come back and they have a wedding. They have a proper gift getting, giving, a proper wedding. And um, Part of the arrangement is that the, the father-in-law, the, the Lord of the deep sea says to the daughter, the one who is kidnapped, I will be born to you when I am born to you, don't be afraid and drop me back into the sea. And when the sky is like this with surus clouds in the distance, even ordinary humans may come out to me for food. When they see me like this, common surface birds, that's the, the myth name for humans, may come to me for food. So th this is uh, astounding to me because you can read, at, at least as an uninformed audience coming to it for the first time, you can, you can read this story for uh, almost all the way through, thinking that the best that can come of this is restoring the original status quo, getting the, the human daughter back. Uh, and at worst, it's going to end in complete disaster. But it turns out that this is the story of how it comes to be that humans can get food from the sea. This is the building of the relationship between the sea and human beings in myth. Now there's a lot of levels, I think, uh, on which we could make connections between this story and modern oceanography. The theme of disaster in the form of rising seas, this feeling that the deep sea is the source of all wealth as well as disaster. The, the focus on cycles and exchanges more than individuals. That's really the core of ecological thinking, I think, to emphasize the interaction, the relationship more than the, inter, the individual. But to me, again, as a builder of models, what really stands out to me is a, a very particular kind of instability in this story. And what I mean by that becomes clearer if we add another story about the same hat. Now back to, to Kuna, there are these uh, glorious house poles standing in front of these big communal houses in the 1800s. Uh, but as I said, this was the time that the village was emptying. And one of those house poles came to stand in the Haida Gwaii Museum in Skidiga. Here it is, it, this shows Raven, the, the trickster, uh, who put so much of the world in the configuration it's in, uh, on top of the hat of the headman of a village named Kingi. Now this mountain is Kingi at the head of a, a huge sea law, but every mountain in Haida, Gwai, uh, Haida mythology is also a village. It's also the headman of that village who's known as the town mother. And that headman is also um, uh, a spirit killer whale with two fins. So Kingi, the headman of this village. Now on this occasion, it's Raven who's wearing the hat. And he's, uh, he's sitting offshore. He's feeling extremely unhappy for reasons that are part of another story. And as, as that sea foam begins to churn around the edge of his hat, the water starts to rise in the village. And Kingi, his, his chief's hat, uh, begins to grow taller and taller with rings uh, on the top. These are the rings that a, a headman would get when he um, through an enormous potlatch, and they're a sign of, of power and generosity. 
And the people of the village climb onto the hat to escape the rising waters and the waters rise and the hat rises, the waters rise and the hat rises. And finally, Raven cuts Kingi's hat in two and half the village falls dead at a stroke. Which feels like um, poetic hyperbole, but as, as Bringhurst uh, kind of horribly reminds us, it's actually poetic understatement. Because after all, this was what King uh, Kuna was becoming already by the time that Sky told this story. This is the remains of one of those great houses. You can still visit it there under the guidance of uh, the Haida watchman. We'll call you to sure. Here's one of those house poles uh, turning back into the forest. Um, an eagle on a house pole turning back into a huckleberry bush. The point is that it, it, you could graph the, the story like this. There's the hat and then a bunch of oscillations back and forth between various characters and a turning point of the shells that stabilizes it, that starts to damp down those oscillations again. And it leads to this point of great um, stability in the first story where even ordinary humans may come out to me for food. But other stories begin almost exactly the same way with the same hat and they follow the same progression for some time and yet they end in disaster. And as a reader of these stories, uh, who is, is not Haida, who didn't grow up with them, at least, I can't tell <laughs> coming to these stories until the, the last half page, whether this is one of the stories that is going to end in the securing of something wonderful in the world or end in everybody dying. That, that's the instability that I find myself chasing after with mathematical models. So let me tell you a little bit more about uh, the plankton models that I'm thinking of, because this kind of modeling is, um, in Brinkhurst's mind, another kind of mythology, another kind of pocket universe um, that you build in order to watch how the parts interact and how it refracts the real world just in computational form. So back to the plankton at the base of the food chain. Really, you, you could start this story anywhere. You could start it at the scale of um, salmon, for example, a resource that would have been known to the Haida uh, from time immemorial, or where an oceanographer would start it, down in the plankton. Let's start down in the plankton. Now again, there's this kind of indeterminacy where um, sometimes plankton dynamics um, lead to uh, the sustainability of rich resources from the sea, sometimes empty nets and toxic blooms. So how can that be? Where does that come from? How would you start building up a model of it? Well, in the simplest form, we write down a, a set of equations. If you just are thinking about one kind of phytoplankton, one kind of zooplankton, that's animal plankton that are eating the phytoplankton, and the nutrients left behind um, by the zooplankton that then make more phytoplankton. Uh, I've drawn some terrestrial analogs here to make it a bit clearer. So we can write down a set of equations for that. And it turns out that even in an equation that simple, in a system that simple, depending on how strong you make the predation on the predator, that's the red circle, you can either find a stable equilibrium or an oscillation, a, a cycling. That is a, a cycling between the nutrients and the plants and the animals. Um, that takes the form of an oscillation out of phase for each of those bits individually. Now consider the diversity of plankton in the ocean that a single microscope image like I showed you before does uh, suggest, I suppose. There's small and large and there's a matching spectrum of microzooplankton that are grazing them and releasing nutrients to different rates. In general, you could say that small plankton grow fast and are eaten fast. And then there's large ones that grow more slowly and are eaten more slowly. And so this takes the form of a variety of those oscillations coupled to each other. If you write all that down in a set of equations and add just a little bit of, of randomness to which of these grazers has a preference for which of these phytoplankton, you get a picture more like this. <laughs> 
it, you can ignore the numbers. That's the, the size of the organism in, in microns. The important thing is the dot size. The dot size is the abundance of that particular species at a certain point in time. So this is a, a model of just a simple closed tank, not even a, a realistic patch of the ocean, being fed by nutrients at a constant rate. And what you get over time is a really complicated pattern where different things are blooming at, at different times. Something will appear and last for, for a really long time and then it will disappear without warning. And nothing in the external environment of the system is changing. This is simply all of those relationships that are unfolding at different speeds working themselves out um, in combination because every phytoplankton is grazed by a number of zooplankton and every zooplankton eats a number of phytoplankton. And so if you lived in this world, and I would say that we do live in this world, you might find that for no particular reason, things were appearing and then disappearing again, that you couldn't count on uh, stability uh, ever, that we would always be moving. And if you graph the abundance of two of these species um, from, that graph, uh, from that model over time, you get this figure, which previously I was using to be slightly tricky as a graph of the motion of the story. Now, uh, just very quickly, uh, I'll mention how th that, that these dynamics scale up. They, they go up the food chain and um, out to very long time scales. You might think that something like a salmon that's um, coming from a river, it's crossing thousands of miles of ocean, uh, wouldn't actually react all that hard to fluctuations in the, in the plankton. And yet somehow, very different numbers of salmon come back from the ocean in different years. A classic bit of fisheries oceanography is the story of salmon in the North Pacific and what's called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, where uh, this is a, a, just a mode at which the ocean atmosphere system in the Pacific likes to ring. Once you set it moving, it just carries on like this for a while. There's a spatial pattern of warm here, cold there, and then uh, some number of years later, cold here, warm there, and almost a hand and glove pattern. And coherent with this, during the cool phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, a lot of salmon come back to rivers uh, down south in uh, the U.S., the mainland U.S., south of Haida Gwaii. In the warm phase, more fish come back to uh, the northern rivers in the Gulf of Alaska, north of Haida Gwaii. So here we have 2,000, 2,000 mile stretches of ocean oscillating in the, the abundance of salmon out of phase with each other, like one of these oscillators. And this oscillation has been going on uh, for as long as we have records. And when you go out to longer and longer timescales, uh, you find more and more oscillations. It never seems to flatten out. Here, for example, is uh, archaeological work uh, in Alaska, uh, together with a, a reconstruction of 2,000 years of salmon abundance in Alaska that was worked out from the, the, uh, the nutrients that uh, salmon leave behind in a layer um, in Alaskan lake beds. They, these nutrients in the right lakes will build up year by year, and you can read them a bit like tree rings. And what this shows is a thousand year period where the salmon declined, and then a, a 800 year period where they returned. And human cultures followed the salmon. During periods when the salmon are abundant in the lakes, they live on the coast, they have fish hooks in their trash. During the thousand years that the salmon disappear, they move inland, they just eat something else. And now of course, we're entering one of these low phases again. If you were going to summarize the, the dynamic here, the dynamic that I think Sky shows so well um, in these stories, and I hope I've, I've managed to suggest to you in, in my telling of a telling of a telling of a telling of his story, uh, and that I find myself chasing after 
with equations. It would simply be the idea that the ocean at all scales is very easily set ringing. And that these fluctuations and oscillations, of course, can be disasters, uh, like a toxic bloom, but they are also what makes the world livable. This is the form that abundance in the ocean takes. So down there are a few links, uh, depending on which piece of this you'd like to learn more about, uh, a few different places uh, that you could jump in. And if you're curious about the, the Haida stories, I hope that you will take a look and um, see uh, how the Haida uh, talk about living with the ocean in their own words. And thank you. And I look forward to uh, some discussion. Well, that's fascinating, Neil. Would you say that the big difference between their world and ours is that our world is a, a world of things, fairly rigid, solid, predictable. We like to think of predictable things, whereas their world is fresh, alive, dynamic, flux, unpredictable, where you've got to be very, very sharp and observant to stay surviving. It, 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 it's interesting, your, your choice of words there, uh, because a, a Haida proverb that uh, Bringhurst picks up on in, in interpreting these stories, and that I also see in the Haida Marine Plan as one of the guiding principles, that Marine Plan, uh, the proverb is, the world is as sharp as a knife. I would say, I'm not sure if, if I would say the distinction is, is things versus uh, living things, possibly. And, uh, and also, I'm not sure um, how you would generalize about the sense of control and predictability. That's also quite complicated to, to unpick. But what I would say, what I think is safe to say, is that um, the Haida perspective on living in the natural world is about, re about re relationships, uh, uh, an entire web of relationships. I, I mean, in... in traditional times uh, between villages, between families, I mean, still between communities, between families, but also with every element of that uh, living world around them. I think we, we try in a, a technocratic way to be more selective about what we need to have a relationship with, and it doesn't always go so well. Would the, the stories be a means of each generation giving a picture of the world to the next generation, something that they needed to better understand what was round about them. Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. I, I think, you know, uh, pe people have, have long tried to figure out why advice about fisheries management would be encoded in, in these symbolic stories. It, you, you can sense that when people are trying to to understand traditional indigenous fisheries management around the world, they almost seem a little um, confused or embarrassed that they're talking for one chapter of their fisheries management book about stories about talking animals. But I think I, I think it, it's not. Um, I think that practical wisdom and artistic metaphorical wisdom get passed down together in. Uh, a combination that on a good day you, you would recognize in, in our culture as well. I think it, it's mainly a matter of, of honoring both sides of that. Now, some scientists are dismissive about anything in the past using words like superstition. How did you find as a scientist you got on when you began to tell your fellow scientists that there was a reason to respect that worldview and the stories that were coming from the past? I, I would say that most of the scientists I know, um, they, they want to engage with um, traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, knowing where to jump in is, is another thing. I, I, but I, I find that, um, you know, there's, a, there's another dimension to this, of course, which is that in, in Canada, especially, the, the desire to find a, 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 an honest, symmetrical, truly mutually beneficial way for um, science and indigenous communities to work together has, has reached a, um, 
I, I would say a new level of sophistication in the last 10, 20 years. There's, um, there's a quite serious charge when you start um, trying to do oceanography in, partnership, in partnerships in Canada to, to really mean it about um, doing work that benefits the community with, that engages with communities and their traditional knowledge. Very often that traditional knowledge is of a much more uh, literal form, a much more usable form actually than the, the fairly conceptual metaphorical literary um, angle that I'm going after here. How all those pieces fit together into partnerships, I, everyone is still feeling their way. But I, I would say that, um, that there isn't quite, that there isn't the same dismissal um, out of hand that uh, would come from earlier generations, which is encouraging. A question from Richard and Murray, who comments about the old oral tradition of storytelling in decline in so many places. And he wonders how the Haida had managed to retain their tradition for so long. Yeah. Now, I, I you know, I, I have never done community engaged ethnography in Haida Gwaii. Uh, everything I can tell you is, is third hand. One thing uh, to know about that history is that it, it wasn't really a, a continuous preservation necessarily. Um, there was an extremely dark time uh, for a generation, uh, um, Scottish generation and also the generation afterwards, when it was incredibly difficult to preserve these traditions. The, the potlatch, all forms of ritual expression and, and communal uh, ritual were literally outlawed. And in those times, I, I think, I'm sure that uh, an, an, an awful richness got lost. The, the cultural renaissance began really in the 50s. How families underground managed to preserve these stories and preserve their connections to the past, I don't know. That's, that's within those communities. Um, but I, all I can say is that, um, that the current visibility and vibrancy of Haida culture and its integration into um, a, a fair degree of autonomy and managing natural resources is very hard won. And it uh, was nearly lost uh, much more strongly than it actually was. Richard has a second question, which is about your range of qualifications. He's fascinated about them and he wonders which came first and then how exactly did each one lead to the next one? Well, when, when I was an undergrad uh, in the US, I, I studied physics and comparative religion in, in parallel. It just seemed like the thing to do. It just seemed like each one was the antidote to the other. And it took a very long time um, to start feeling like these things might have something to do with each other. Uh, they, they really didn't have anything to do with each other consciously for, oh, I don't know, 20 years of my career or something like that. And it was only reading uh, the right books and the right commentators that I began to see uh, where you could find a common language, a common set of concerns. Uh, part of that, I, I think, is the difficulty of working from plot summary. You know, it's one thing to be working on a, a third hand telling of a story when it's been rendered very, very carefully as um, epic poetry. It's still in some sense um, a dead thing, a, you know, a, a written crystallized artifact from a, a living improvised tradition. Uh, and I'm very aware of that distance. But the, the being able to work from the richness of Ringhurst's translations versus the plot summary that anthropologists left behind in almost uh, every other situation of contact is extraordinary. I don't know very many books like it. One viewer asks a, a technical question. What software applications do you use to model? Uh, right. Well, we write our models from scratch, usually. You can use almost any language. We often use bespoke languages like MATLAB, um, technical stuff like that. But you could sit down with R, um, any language that's good for data science, R or Python, something like that, and just um, start writing loops and lines of code on the page. 
there are packages um, pre-made for this kind of modeling, but if you come to it from physics and oceanography, you, you just start with a blank page and any language will do really. Another viewer asks about the initial satellite image you showed and the plankton blooms and wonders how, how those were mapped. It's very subtle differences in ocean color. You, you can see it with your eye because it, it is just color, uh, but it turns out that you, what, what really is being measured there is not the phytoplankton as a whole, it's the chlorophyll inside the phytoplankton. And how those relate to each other, of course, is, is not clear because any plant doesn't have the same amount of phytoplankton all the time, or uh, there's other pigments uh, besides chlorophyll that plants will use to photosynthesize. But chlorophyll is the main one, and it absorbs light in a particular way, meaning it's a particular color. And so um, by matching up these satellite images that literally take a photo of some big swath of the earth and ship-based observations going across that image, gradually, gradually people have worked out these algorithms where you can infer the amount of living stuff in any bit of the ocean. And then another, oh, sorry. <laughs> another viewer asks, with this fascinating mix of areas of research you're doing, what's your current one? Well, what I've started working on recently, as Howie mentioned, is the problem of the decline of Atlantic salmon. Um, the Missing Salmon Alliance and Atlantic Salmon Trust um, have uh, really great partnerships between people who um, provide a, a context for us to start to match up things that have changed for salmon in freshwater uh, versus what happens to them when they leave our coast and go out to sea for the first few months and the few months after that and the few months after that when they're crossing large swaths of the Atlantic Ocean, similar to the uh, Pacific fish I showed you an image of. And we're gradually piecing together uh, a, a story that begins in the phytoplankton actually. And one of these subtle shifts in the composition over time that we think might explain uh, why so few salmon are, are coming back from the ocean compared with how they used to. Maybe but that's a story for a, a, another festival, Howie. Well, we're looking forward to welcoming you back because you visited us, I think, twice. And the, so this will be your, your third participation. Indeed. Well, we want to welcome you back and in person the next time. Neil, thank you very much indeed. Just before rounding, rounding off, I should say on the subject of stories that at nine o'clock tonight in the Orkney Club, Neil Price will be telling us of some detective work in family history that he carried out. And the story is Dickens's favourite blacking factory. To find out the Dickens connection, the blacking connection and the factory connection, well, nine o'clock it is. And in parallel, if you're at home, there's the sweet sounds of the synthesizer, some absolutely beautiful, I would almost say ethereal sounds coming from a group of uh, extremely interested people, enthusiastic about the synthesizer spread out around the north of Scotland. But now, Neil, I would just like to go back to see you and say thank you very much again. That's fascinating. The range of subjects you have brought together with those satellite images of plankton, the stories of the Haida, the mathematical models, fascinating indeed. We look forward to welcoming you back again to the festival in future years, indeed, hopefully next year. Until then, from us all this evening, and in particular, the technical team who have worked behind the scenes to make this flow so smoothly, thank you very much and good night. <laughs>